Okay, then, hi, and welcome to the talk Keyclock from the EAM point of view. EAM, Identity and Access Management and Identity Governance and Administration bring so many aspects and I want, you, uh, I want to introduce you to the most important ones today. I also want to look at you with different use cases of identity and access management like Enterprise EAM brings very different requirements than, for example, customer identity and access management. And um, so in this context, I want to you to just understand uh, your Keyclock use case to see what do you need to do, where do you maybe need to write an extension. And um, yeah, I hope this is helpful for all of you. If you have any questions, you can just ask me straight away. Or at the end, I will hope to keep some time also for questions. But let me first introduce myself. So my name is Robert. I'm co-founder from Intention. We founded ourselves 25 years ago from the University of Stuttgart. And so I'm a developer by heart. I developed, developed in Java many, many years. And currently I'm doing the product management at Intention. And uh, I know Keyclock since um, 2014, but more from the user side of things. And um, yeah, and really loved it, or got to, got to love it in the projects. We saw it's really, really a good tool. And um, if I'm not in front of the screen, I'm in my garden. I'm collecting tomatoes. I also love to bake pizza and cakes, and a uh, big fan of uh, Great British Bake Off. <laughs> and also like to um, experiment. Is this a problem here with the connection, maybe? Maybe the cable has a little buckle contact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tonight I switched the slides from uh, German to English, so if some German words is just uh, popping out. Maybe I switch the connector to the other side. Usually works. Let's hope this is more stable. So, and what brought me to this um, talk is actually um, that uh, when I looked at the Keyclock open source website, it always says it's an open source identity and access management. But until last year, if you had a look at the uh, Red Hat product website for the Red Hat SSO, it uh, just said something of single sign on. So Red Hat SSO for web single sign on and it doesn't mention the identity and access management part anymore. So this made me uh, really curious to just um, get into this as a topic. But Red Hat of course very elegantly solved this problem now by just saying, okay, we don't do Red Hat SSO anymore. We just call it the Red Hat build of Keyclock, which I think makes perfectly sense because it's basically the same thing so, and I want to also briefly repeat what also um, Thomas and others um, introduced us uh, this morning already. So, when we talk about identity and access management, what is it really about? So, we have basically um, three parts here. It's about the identification, the identification of the user or of the machine or of uh, an account or of a device. Um, so the question basically is, who are you? And then the next is the authentication, which is, um, do you have proof for this? So can you really prove that you are who you uh, pretend to be, which is classically, it's a password or a second factor, but more complicated with devices where you actually have a trust relationship. So this also somehow merges. And um, the, the third thing is um, the authorization. So the question, are you allowed to do what you want to do? So users accessing a web service, do they really um, are allowed to do that? So this is basically the uh, three um, aspects of identity and access management. And um, now if we look today at all the um, different websites from consulting companies and everything, um, basically there are these terms flying around the identity and access management, and then there is identity and governance administration. So for me, this 
are somehow umbrella terms which um, mostly refer to the same things and I think there are so many features and aspects um, on EAM and EGA and I briefly categorized them into four categories so you can find these categories or pillars also on, on other websites but it's there's no standard for this so this is just my classification for this and uh, we are going to look at these categories and I'll just briefly show you what is important in this category, what really defines identity management, what is important on access management and so on. And then also for the different EAM use cases, we will um, have a look what are the requirements for the different use cases because EAM solutions are always tailored to specific use cases and organizational requirements and um, the implementation may just vary and you will just come up in every project probably with so different requirements that you always have a project. <laughs> also it's very interesting um, the on-prem versus the cloud approach because um, and this is I think also where Keyclock is very good because since you can download it as a container you can run it anywhere you can run it in your basement as good as you can run it in the cloud or with any service provider. So let's have a look at the first uh, category which is about the identity management or identity management or administration of identities. So um, important aspects here are for example to have a central identity store you need to be sure to have one database which uniquely identifies your identities and um, knows about their um, characteristics. You need to know how you can identify them, like for which characteristics, and this is the so-called single source of truth, so the one database which defines your uh, identities. Another very important aspect of the identity management is the um, life cycle management of those identities because identities are not just there they um, somehow get created get modified and also get deleted because the accounts get deleted or in an enterprise because the people uh, leave or uh, retire so there's constant change and um, or you have partners you work with and you only want to contract them for half a year so you just need to approach all these um, issues. Then another aspect is um, organizational management which is also very important because um, especially in enterprises but also in B2B use cases usually users are uh, related to some kind of organization if it's uh, in a company you have different organizational structures you have different departments and um, people are just, or also in, in, in Active Directory, you know the, the groups, where people are in groups. So this is one form also to categorize the um, users, the identities, which is very useful, for example, to later on also um, authorize them with the right roles. So then there is, of course, the credentials management, which is important. So every user needs somehow to authenticate with um, passwords, with second factor. You want to have self-service here. You want to be sure that um, users can also self-service themselves here. And um, then another thing is the provisioning. So this is mostly in very classic workforce enterprise settings where you have so many different systems which also want to be informed about the users so that they are there so that um, accounts can be privileged or, or whatever and it's um, also about having employees being able to work on the first date on the first day when they get into um, a new job at a new company and um, I just checked this against uh, what Keyclock can do and I made here some, some check marks where I think uh, Keyclock provides these features. So Keyclock has its own database. Uh, you're not relying on um, an LDAP. You can use LDAP, you can connect everything, but 
comes with its own database where you can manage those ident identities and you can also manage them centrally here to be in this um, sense of the identity management, you have your single source of truth here. Then for the lifecycle management, I put a question mark because um, there are, I've, most of you probably know this, when you have users registering, what happens if the user does not uh, finish up the email validation, for example. You just end up with um, an entry in your database. So this is where the lifecycle thing begins because you want to be compliant, you want to be GDPR conform, and you need something to um, remove this. And I put a question mark because these are things which you can very easily take care of by some cron job through the API or extensions or whatever you like. Then the organizational management, I, I put a check box because we have groups, we have a certain kind of um, possibilities to also have a hierarchy in the groups, although I think, for, I think that for a really um, efficient organizational management, some things um, can be improved there. We have, of course, the credentials management, but what Keycloak does not bring is any provisioning engine. So this is also, I think, uh, completely out of scope for a product like Keycloak to take care of provisioning. But this is just for you to know if you're in a use case where you need to do provisioning, you need to take care of this with some other um, tool maybe or write good code. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> Well, the provisioning, suppose that you have an identity provider link, yes. and the user comes in via that identity provider, right? then, then the user is created in mm -hmm. the Keycloak database. Wouldn't you say that that is some kind of provisioning? This is also some kind uh, of provisioning, can yes. You, can you repeat the question for uh, the sorry. audience? Because they cannot hear. So the, the, the question is that um, if through an identity broker a user gets uh, sent to Keycloak, so Keycloak creates the user in its database. If this is also some kind of provisioning, that's true. But uh, Keycloak is not having like the active part here because it's uh, the receiving end of the identity. And this is more a lifecycle <coughs> management problem you get because what happens if the user in the um, source system is no longer existing? So, um, and there are some, some strategies which some of you applied like uh, having a look at the last log in time um, stamp, for example, to see, okay, if the user hasn't logged in for a certain time, we just remove him. You just have to find something which um, fits the data protection requirements, but also if there is um, customization or any added values or roles within the user that you don't need to do this again when the user logs on the next day, which can happen. But these are things which need to be addressed, yes? If we are already on the uh, um, point of question, um, you put a check mark to the to the central user store yes. uh, and uh, with regards to identity objects uh, keycloak doesn't uh, distinguish between identity and account mm -hmm. and in the enterprise access management we all, uh, often have that identities are managed like the person mm -hmm. who's living in the company or uh, the life cycle throughout the company, but has several accounts. Like for example, in IT, they have the regular account and the underscore admin. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably would not say that Kiklo can fulfill the central identity store uh, mm -hmm. in, in a perfect way, uh, because it's only account store. What's your opinion on that? So the question is about the um, central identity store in Kiklo, if this is an identity store or an account store. And um, I would say it's an identity score because we have a map matching in key clock from one identity to one account. So it would fulfill this uh, requirement for me. But of course, you're right. If you're looking at the provisioning and you provision users to other systems, then you create accounts in those systems uh, which are triggered by the provisioning, but which will not be like uh, managed by, by key clock in this case. Okay, so let's move on to the next category, which is, which is the access management. This is more familiar because we have the single sign-on. So the um, login moved away from the application to a central service, which uh, is still a common um, challenge nowadays uh, that uh, people have the login functionality, username, password, 
um, implemented in their applications. So this is one big uh, reason also for many people to use Keycloak and go ahead and have the central application which takes care of the single sign-on. Um, of course, uh, we can secure, we need secure access to the web applications where Keycloak is very good at with the standard um, support of the protocols. We also need to secure the access to the APIs, which is again authentication, authorization. Of course, there is the uh, multi-factor authentication where Keycloak is also providing out of the box uh, pretty good standards with TOTP. Also, you might find use cases where push-based um, multi-factor authentication is um, a better approach, but then there are also plugins for external service providers available which you can just add to your Keycloak. Then we have the um, adaptive authentication, which is um, an assessment of an authentication request. Usually you do just like a risk score calculation, which could be based on the IP address or on the, like, on the geolocalization of the IP address. If you have a user logging on this morning from Germany, then he's doing an impossible travel and he logs on from South America. So this is part here. And um, adaptive authentication then rates an authentication request and either denies it or, for example, asks the user to, um, again, use the second factor to authenticate himself. Then, of course, there's identity brokering. I don't need to say much on that. And uh, social logins are also quite useful when it comes to certain use cases. So again, I just put my check marks here on, on most of the stuff. The um, secure access to, to APIs, I think it's, it's good, but there are some um, aspects which are really important if you publish your APIs, especially to the outside world, which needs to be taken care of. The um, multi-factor authentication is good, but still, if you want to have um, different things, you just need to add an extension. Or if you nowadays use the Google Authenticator or the Microsoft Authenticator, you, you see that they switched from a different um, push system to something where you get a push notification and have to type in a number. This is to avoid the so-called multi-factor fatigue because it was a um, a problem that hackers just sent so many push requests to the people that at some point in time they were so annoyed that they just say, yeah, I'll accept it, and the hacker was in. So this was the reason for Microsoft and uh, Google to switch the authentication here for the um, second factor. Adaptive authentication, there are some things there with the context-based authentication as we, um, access control as we heard with uh, Thomas' talk. But still, you can do lots of extensions here. It's also something where you can, can bring in AI approaches, like if you want to, but then to use AI, you need to collect many data. You need to do profiles of the users. And then the question is, do you want to do that in your context, or do you just uh, raise other data protection concerns? And um, just talking about um, APIs, I, I want to mention briefly one incident which happens uh, which, with T-Mobile US in November in 2022, where um, somebody got access to their API for 41 days, and they were able to, able to download 37 million um, data sets from, from the customers. And well, they, they called it a limited set of account data, but in, included the date of birth. So, uh, I think it's it's quite tricky, but um, I think the problem here is that even if you secure your API and you have a user with a token or a request with a token and the authentication, everything is fine, you still need to detect these things. So when somebody just comes and downloads massive amounts of data from your API, you need to do a threat detection, a threat modeling here to um, have just other tools in place that um, a rate limitation of an API gateway, of course, helps, but um, yeah, it's, it's not good if you only detect it after 41 days if somebody looks have, has a look at the uh, log files. So you also need to have uh, alerting mechanisms here and um, so on. But just on a, on a side note, this. So the <coughs> third part is the uh, access uh, governance which is all about authorizations. So um, basically, 
uh, when in key clock we connect an LDAP system and LDAP synchronizes the groups for the users, everything is done. We don't need to take care about uh, like adding uh, authorizations to users or not because users are already assigned in a group, so one, somebody else took care of it. But um, just using key clock and, and wanting to do some kind of automatic assignment and withdrawal of authorizations can be quite tricky. Of course, you have default roles. You can assign um, or, or set groups uh, with, with default roles which get assigned when users enter a group. But um, it's uh, more than that. Also, you need lifecycle management for authorizations, which, which especially in enterprise environments comes with the so-called accessory certification. So either you have uh, authorizations which have a limited amount of validity, which can also be useful in other um, use cases. For example, if you sell subscriptions of your product to a customer or the the customer buys a day pass to access some online content. So all these are authorizations which have a um, limited lifespan and you need to take care of this. And um, the accessory certification in an enterprise environment is basically compliance driven. So um, the companies need to make sure that the people having certain access this needs to be reviewed and needs to be checked and depending on the size of the company you can do this with a manual process you can send an email report to the um, to the responsible manager with a list of employees and their um, access rights and you can just tell them hey it's fine they can still have the access but the more users you ha have the more cumbersome the whole process will be so you need to automate this somehow and um, also, this comes together with workflows. Workflows here are meant to be approval workflows where somebody can just, for example, either request access to a certain system, then he gets a role assigned, but the role actually only gets assigned after approval, which can be one step or even two step or three step. They are the more critical the things you're doing are, for example, in, in critics and in critical infrastructure, then we have seen after um, th um, until three step uh, approval workflows until a role gets assigned. And if you have external people, maybe it's even more. So this is all complicated. And um, I think this is clearly not the focus of uh, Keyclock to do this. So sure, we have a limited possibility to assign uh, authorizations in form, for example, from, from roles. But withdrawal is something where you really need to work on. Also, there's no real life cycle management for those authorizations. But there are good access control mechanisms, which are also important. So if you have other systems or other processes taking care of these um, and the, the assignment of the authorizations, then Keyclock is a good tool to make use of it and deliver it to the applications or to evaluate it and tell the application at least if the user is allowed to access it or not. Then workflows and accessory certification, I think is, is out of scope here, but there are very good other open source tools which could do this. So the um, next category is access intelligence and big part is here also risk mitigation. All this is also often compliance driven. So either you have certifications or you're listed in the stock exchange or doing critical infrastructure. So you really need to put a lot of effort here. And it's about um, just making sure that the users have the right authorizations and only the ones they need. A common thing is the segregation of duty here so that you can mark or define roles which are not allowed to be on the same person, like the approver and the um, genehmiger and, uh, sorry, English German, <laughs> confusion. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, you need to monitor this, and there needs to be very good auditing here of everything that goes on with the accesses, and these are also data which, uh, and this is where the access intelligence comes in, um, can be analyzed to see if there are conflicts um, that need to be resolved 
to also detect if a user, for example, of a certain organizational unit has way more um, authorizations than other people in the same area. So this um, shall be detected there. Role mining is also helpful that you um, automatically try to figure out which are the right authorizations for, for example, new people joining in uh, certain organizations of your enterprise. And um, last but not least, there is the privileged access management, which is a topic on its own, which is about uh, securing access to uh, critical systems, to backend systems, to secure the, the root access. And uh, usually um, you put into place here proxy solutions, which just shield all the applications or the critical systems from the general access from the regular network. And you only accept them through a proxy, either by desktop sharing or also by the terminal. And um, yeah, this is something I think where we can for sure say that um, we would be happy if somebody else did. It was a good tool to take care of this <laughs> project, this thing. So yeah, this is um, from the key clock point of view. You can write many extensions, of course. But um, I think if you see that you have these requirements, it's just good to have a discussion to see how to solve these things. And uh, talking about access intelligence, I briefly want to mention that there's the upcoming um, NIST 2 um, European Union regulation, <coughs> which uh, was, I think, published last year, but needs to be implemented in Germany, I think, until October. And um, they talk in this uh, guideline about um, cyber hygiene that needs to be implemented. And um, they say it should be state of the art or Stand der Technik. I think state of the art in English uh, sounds way better than Stand der Technik in German, which sounds like OK. <laughs> and uh, so what is um, state of the art? Well, currently, I think we can say that um, this is a multi-factor authentication, so you need to be sure to, to implement this. Um, I wouldn't say that you uh, would go for any AI-based uh, things there regarding adaptive authentication, because it's not that state of the art. It's all about um, access control. And um, yeah, the interesting thing is that now it's like uh, a chef Sache. So your boss needs to take care of this, because they will be obligated by this guideline to do so. So let's have a look at the different uh, use cases. So um, identity and access management in a um, enterprise, or it's also called VM workforce. Um, the important parts here are lifecycle management. I need to connect also um, different HR systems, probably. I need to transport the data. I need to consolidate the data. I need to make sure that I have unique identities, So the, which is missing here on the, on the slides. The, a single source of truth, of course, uh, the governance, the organizational structures. I need to manage uh, partners and external users. I need to do risk management. And if I'm in a big, important enterprise, uh, for sure, I also need to implement the privileged access management. And I just want to bring an, in another um, hack, or and this time it's a, it's a ransomware attack. It happened in, in May. 2021, and uh, it was the colonial pipeline in the United States. They are um, critical infrastructure because they supply the um, southeast of the uh, US uh, with uh, roughly 55% of um, fuel. And um, so they got hacked. And um, I think they um, encrypted some of their billing systems. So actually, they were not able to bill any longer. So they just halted the pipeline. <laughs> and um, after four days, uh, fuel ran out at, uh, at, at gas stations. And people started to do panic buys. And it took them six days to, to go or to put the pipeline into operations again. And uh, we know more about this incident because they had a hearing in the house. So um, the CEO. Uh, was just uh, interviewed and he said, so how did it happen? Um, the breach was through a legacy virtual private network VPN system, which um, was unused at the time, but still active and um, didn't have the multi-factor authentication in place. And um, 
Then they said, okay, the VPN login to an employee believed to be inactive. And they also noted that the employee may have used the password on a different website that were previously compromised. So what they did was a credential stuffing attack here. They just had their database with the passwords from some other breach and tried as long as they found one which um, let them in. And um, But I think you can see in this example how important a good identity and access management solution or implementation in an enterprise is because you need to have the life cycle management. So if an employee cannot be believed to be inactive, he is either active or inactive. And if he's no longer working for the company, he needs to be deprovisioned, deprovisioned in all the systems. So you can't have uh, an account active for that uh, user in the VPN. And um, also another problem, which also we see a lot in the real life projects is that migrations of all those systems is always a pain and takes much longer as it uh, should, but it's a reality. So yeah, difficult to, to have a general solution here, but this just as a little motivation um, that a good identity and access management is important. Okay, so the next um, use case uh, which is commonly uh, found is um, the B2B customer identity and access management which has very different requirements than enterprise management because um, I want to manage my, my customers. I want my customers to manage them and their users themselves and uh, also important here are things like automated user provisioning through scheme which, for example, if I have identity brokers, if I have at my customers identity brokers, and many of them nowadays have the Entra ID, Entra ID supports the scheme provisioning, and you can keep your customer in control of the life cycle for its employees. So I think this is um, pretty important um, in the B2B scenario, and uh, also, of course, it's important to um, have an easy onboarding here for the, for the customers. And then there's the scalability because a B2B solution might scale very different from an enterprise solution which has more or less a fixed amount of users. Maybe you have a rush hour in the morning when the users log on or something like that, but it's a very different kind of scalability that you have for the uh, B2B um, use cases. Then there's the customer, um, I, or the, the B2C customer identity and access management, which again has uh, different requirements. So here it's all about user experience. Yeah, I want uh, users to be able to onboard effortless, seamless, having a great experience. That's why it's also important here to um, support the social logins because I want my users, maybe I don't even want them to spend time on the registration. I want just them to use their Apple ID, log on, and then double click on the, um, on the iPhone and just buy my product. Um, we have different requirements on, on content management here. And content management is um, not just the um, the data protection agreement, but also, for example, newsletters. Yeah. So, and this is also something where we have an overlapping here with um, the CRM providers, and many CRM providers just want to get into customer identity and access management here because anyway they want to know about the users. So um, this is, but we also have had um, people we talked to which found okay, shall we do it in, in Salesforce or shall we keep it in um, our own solution. Then there's the single sign-on, but single sign-on <coughs> with um, another kind of uh, aspect. I want them to only log on once actually, because I, when the next time when they hit uh, the website or the application, I just want them to be able to directly do some kind of uh, shopping and not annoy them with um, having to log on again. Then adaptive authentication and threat detection are also very important here. And uh, because I also have another example again, why this is very important. So why you should uh, take care of these things, especially if you are uh, handling users um, or, or end customers directly in the internet, in the, in, the, in the wide open. And you probably also heard of this. This was the <coughs> 23andMe breach which started in May 2023 
uh, it was another credential stuffing attack and it was ongoing for five months. In the five months, um, the hackers found uh, 14,000 uh, accounts which they could uh, get gain access to just by using those databases with passwords floating around in the internet. And it affected um, nearly 7 million of their customers. This is, of course, a, a special to the business model of 23andMe. This is one of the companies where you can buy those DNA test sets where you just spit into this little plastic thing, you send them in, and then you can download your DNA data on, the, on their website. And, um, and then it works like Facebook because there are relatives popping up through the matching of the DNA, so that's why they, and, and you share this data, and that's why they got access to the data of so many people here. But uh, what's really not good is to, to have this ongoing for five months. So you need this kind of, of threat detection. You need to be aware of this. And um, yeah, well, then they reset the password of all the customers, which you probably also want to avoid at some point in time. And if you looked at um, the other platforms, I think MyHeritage and, and Ancestry, um, they just say, ah, OK, let's do multi-factor authentication now. <laughs> Okay, briefly now on the, um, on the um, IoT, which, um, where we have many devices. I think there are two main use cases for the IoT. Um, there we have the devices that act are actually somehow uh, related to a user, and this is probably everything we can privately buy with a biotemperature sensor from my, my garden. I just need to create an account, and it's probably somehow related to my identity. But what about all those sensors um, which I need to authenticate in a factory or in, an, in a power plant. So um, this is something where you need very different infrastructure. So I think um, user-bound devices you can probably also with handle with Keyclock. Um, maybe you just want to use offline refresh tokens or something like that, but otherwise you need to complete PKI infrastructure with certificates. You need to be able to update the certificates on the devices, and um, so this is just a very different thing. Okay, then quickly on the um, use cases for different industries. Um, I just don't want to go into all the details, maybe just um, highlight if we talk about education, uh, what uh, also from our experience when we talk to universities is very important, for example, to be able to integrate your identity and access management solution with the existing um, networks, uh, which is in Germany, the Deutsche Forschungsnetwerk, but also EduGain and or Ovidis, which is the, the Schüler login for, for Germany. And um, this is a bit special because the Deutsche Forschungsnetwerk and EduGain, they, uh, for example, use a SAML federation where you need to do some implementing to be able to make Keyclock connect to, to that or better use maybe a little proxy before that. And um, the other thing in healthcare, which is important right now, is the Gesundheits-ID. So if you're working with um, digital applications or the e-recipe, you, you will see this coming up. And um, yeah, so let me just uh, maybe conclude what you want to develop in Keycloak. So you want to take care of the lifecycle management. This is fun for developers because you can just get your hands on the on the keyboard and, and start hacking. There are so many things that you could do. And this is just to like give you an, an idea of uh, what is uh, there. And so you are aware of the context you're in and can decide for yourself if you can um, do everything with your Keycloak or if you're happy to have other systems there. Then for the um, identity and access management, what uh, will be coming up in the next year. So we have the device-bound digital ID. So I have my, my personal ID on my um, cell phone or other IDs which I will use in future to uh, log in to authenticate for services. Of course, there is um, more on the, on the zero trust security to uh, verify user access all the time. Uh, we will see um, yeah, biometric authentication is, I think, also linked to the digital ID or to the devices as a second factor. But there will be um, the AI coming in 
um, which can be very useful in the anomaly detection and the adaptive authentication. We can use it in role mining. And as I mentioned, the user profiling is a bit of a thing where you really need to um, be aware of if this is something you want to do or not. Anyway, the user experience needs to be improved, especially for the multi-factor authentication. I think this is something where maybe the pass keys in future can help. But um, if, uh, especially in the consumer market, you see multi-factor authentication, it's most of the time that they send you another email or something like that. And all this is not very nice too. It's like a, yeah, it's like of a compromise to, to make it more secure, but uh, the user experience is it's not good here. So we need to, work on that and there will be improvements. And then I come to the part where you can ask questions. <laughs> Good, if there are no other questions then. Um, maybe <coughs> one question or one warning remark. Uh, when you were talking about this einmal anmeldung, like yeah. thing is known for mm. uh, B2C mm. science use cases. I think I heard the term persistent SSO. Persistent SSO, okay, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, you sign in once and you, are, you can you come in. back mm. and mm. still use the shop without signing in. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, question regarding uh, how we can make this lifecycle management or role assignment. So mm -hmm. we have this issue that we want to have metadata about a group assignment or a role mm -hmm. assignment, but a user model is just an end to end relation mm -hmm. in the database. So we have no object in between. And to be honest, I, as a non Java guy, I mm -hmm. don't have any idea how we could get metadata in there without breaking the user model. Any ideas how we can solve that? Uh, well, uh, repeat, sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, so the question was. Um, how can we maybe provide um, the lifecycle for role assignments uh, in Keyclock without breaking the existing data model? And uh, so what we were discussing is it would be great to have um, these extension attributes also for the role assignments, but they do not exist. It's just on the role definition level right now. So uh, what we see is that um, the authorization information is um, just another user attribute. And if you have a special mapper, you can always make sure to check this, for example. I know this is a bit messy, but if you want to do it in Keyclock this way, this is one approach we have seen.